All right, let's welcome in our guest, uh, one of my favorite people in the world, someone who's been uh, had a huge influence on my life, Coach K. Coach, thank you so much for for joining us and for the time. Yeah, it's great being on with you, and uh, I, I love following you on Instagram with your family and uh, the joy. It must have been amazing, huh, to be away from them in that bubble. It was and, awful. And, uh, yeah, <laughs> and then especially with your your kids growing up like that any any moment that you miss but uh i'm glad that that you guys have such a great family um real briefly the last time we spoke on the phone was right after the san antonio game in which we were eliminated from the playoffs Mm -hmm. and you didn't call to to disparage my podcast but you called to tell me you know some encouraging words and and you you know you were bummed for me about us missing the playoffs but somehow we got on the podcast and that's kind of when we laid the the right. groundwork for you coming on this pod but you definitely threw some shots at 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 my 2016 Yahoo podcast <laughs> well you know th- there are small targets to shoot at and there are big targets to shoot at as much as i shot at that podcast i uh I was kind, really, because there were there was a lot of room. <laughs> there was a lot of room there, and and I felt bad for it because you had played your butt off. You you know, you really have developed into a damn good player, I and mean, you were really good here. But you know, taking charges were not part of what you did, and you didn't necessarily lead uh, the ACC in assists. And uh, which was good, by the way, it was better that you didn't pass the ball. But I thought you did everything in the world that day to win a ball game. And that made me uh, made me very proud. Coach, JJ and I talked about this yesterday. I wanted to get myself into this very briefly with this. What sure. was your first impression of him the first time you met him? Well, before meeting him, I saw him play. And... Uh, the first time I saw him play, I said, Oh my God, this kid, this kid has it. I mean, he, uh, he's special. You know, he, I, I, you know, driving back on that, what about a three hour drive? I, I was like floating on air with my assistant to be quite frank with you. I just said, this kid, you know, this kid's going to be amazing because he, he, he not only could shoot and really score, but he played with uh, an all-out heart with no fear. And, uh, and he made some shots that were ridiculous, you know. And uh, uh, <laughs> I, I, I knew we had to have him, you know. And, and obviously, I was really lucky to coach him for, for his four years here at Duke. I still can make ridiculous shots, by the way. You do. <laughs> that and, skill uh, hasn't left. <laughs> yeah, you can. And but you practice that way. Yeah, I do. Yeah, you know, and I'm not sure people realize uh how anal this guy is in his uh uh in his practice routines to the minute and whatever. Have you done have you made tapes of, of, of a of a workout? No, no. So I did do a shooting video when I first came out of yeah. college. It called Better Basketball with JJ Reddick. But I, we are going to do some uh, workouts that we're going to put up on YouTube. Yeah, uh, you should. That's do coming that. this off season. We're the, yeah. it, it, more teaching stuff and 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 trying to help the younger generation and how they and how they sort of prepare. They need to know how hard you have to work and how much you enjoy the hard work and the amount of time. And what you do is game speed, game speed. It, it, don't take it for granted. It's not, it's not alive and well right now. Uh, what you do, uh, I, the day that you were here, you know, where you worked out for a couple of days and our guys watched you, that was, that was so good because our guys learned how to work at another, at a higher level. Yeah. Um, it's, I think it's one of the reasons I've had a long career is because yeah. the, the, the input has led to output and the input has always been consistent and the input has always been at game speed. And it's a huge reason I'm going into year 15. Tommy, just so you know, and I, everybody knows that I was a Duke fan growing up. 
But for me to meet Coach K and to have him recruit me was surreal. And really, and we're going to get into this in a little bit, but really, even through my sophomore year, like it was all still surreal. You have to understand, like, I wasn't just a Duke fan. I was like a fan boy. And so if, if, I, if I turned out to be a shitty basketball player, I would have been the guy who named my dog Reddick or, you know, ca- named my son Cameron or whatever. Like the Duke thing, and I still am. I'm still that way. I'm a, I'm a Duke fanatic. I'm a Duke fan. And so that, that high school recruitment and that first year or two just being in practice and being around coach every day, I was like pinching myself. I can't believe this is happening. Like it, it, was, it, it didn't set in like it was reality. I was pinching myself, but I was so old I couldn't feel it. Uh, but uh, uh, you know, look, you, you were as good a guy as I've coached, and uh, I had so much fun coaching you because my plays worked. Uh, and you know, when people say about giving someone a green light, uh, I gave you a. And, and I should have an amazing green white and you still, as much as you shot, you still didn't take as much advantage of it as, as you could. You were, you know, you were the best shooter ever in the ACC, the best shooter. And, uh, and, you know, one of the all time great players in our, not just at Duke, but in our conference. And, and I'll tell you what, a, a thing that I was uh, really impressed about you is when you became a pro and you were, you had talent obviously with shooting, but you went to a, a higher speed, a more athletic league and you were in the midst of maybe failing and Van Gundy was hard on you. And that was good. And the summer that you spent here becoming a better athlete, it was something that most kid, most guys, most people would never do, because they would, uh, they would, they would let failure be their destination. And instead, it was instead of your destination, it was your motivation. And that summer really took you to a different level. And I know you give a lot of credit to Van Gundy for being hard on you. And uh, but you coming to grips with that reality is something that a lot of guys. A lot of people never come to grips with the, with the reality that the, the, the limit that they're at is not where they should be at if they do more. And then they stop. And you didn't stop. That's why you've been in the league for 15 years, because of that summer and because of that, uh, that so-called – I would call it a – I don't know if failure is a hard word, but, uh, uh, yeah, you weren't going to make it. No, you, you were not going to make it. It became a matter of survival. And I, I was very realistic with myself about that. At some point during my second year, I thought to myself, oh, I might be out of the league. Right. And that summer was between my second and third year. I came in May. I stayed for about two and a half months through you know, mid-July before I went back down to Orlando. I was with Chris Carowell six days a week. I was with Jeff Hauser. I was with Will Stevens, the strength guy. Um, completely <laughs> transformed my yeah. body. I mean, the the my my second year media day photo versus my third year media day photo. Two different people. Um, so that was that was a huge a huge summer for me, Coach. I want to talk some, a little bit about <clears throat> just what's happening right now with right. college basketball and the uncertainty of next season and or, or this coming season due to COVID, um, how, what, what kind of communication are you giving your team right now? What are you, what are you telling them uh, just in, in preparation for what could be uh, another season that, that potentially gets disrupted? Yeah, well, I always believe that, you know, that people can handle the truth. And you never – you just let people know exactly what's going on. So, I mean, our goal is to have a season. Uh, it'll, it'll probably be a disrupted season where there could be cancellation of games. And uh, the goal is to have an NCAA tournament. And that's what college basketball is going to try to do. Although, you know, just looking at college football and saying, well, they're doing this, it's not going to be the same. It, you know, it's a different sport. It's indoors. There's more contact. 
And, uh, and a lot has to do with what the medical protocols will be, uh, especially concerning contact tracing. And, uh, and we're realistic with our guys. We test every day. Our guys got here the first, uh, around the 2nd of August. Uh, at that time, we tested every week. And uh, we've had all negatives. And so our guys have been able, we've been able to work with them in an interesting way. I've, I, I keep my distance from them. And, but my, uh, my coach has started out with one-on-one -on -one, and we have a great practice facility. So they actually got more individual work because you go on four buckets, one guy at a bucket and we've built up and we actually learned to do some things that are better, you know, and our, you know, most of our team is living in the Washington Duke. That's a five-star hotel here on campus. And a number of the teams are there and we've kept our bubble. And uh, <clears throat> it's just, uh, it, it's, they're really an upbeat group. And JJ, this is an interest thing for me. You know, from March until the time our team came, I'm on Zoom all the time. That's how we're communicating. And as a leader, I don't get a feel for my people. You know, like I try to listen more, I ask more questions. But the, one of the main things is, you know, from how I coach and that, uh, you get energy from your team. You give energy, but you get energy. And all of a sudden, you're, you're just giving energy. And it uh, wears your butt out. And all of a sudden, these kids come and boom, I'm at boom. You know, like, boy, this is good. You know, uh, and they've been really energetic and, and good. And we start official practice uh, next week. But uh, they changed where we can work with them about eight hours a week now. We don't really work with them that m as much. But uh, good group. And, you know, my staff is sensational with uh, John and, and Nolan and Chris and Nate and, and then Will Stevens. These kids love our strength coach. This guy's one of the great guys in the whole world. So they're, we're just around good. You know, it's neat to be around good people, but now we're interacting. And so we're getting energy and we're just going to, we're going to keep, we're going to keep getting ready and uh, hopefully good things will happen. You've had to uh, deliver news to your teams uh, a ton over the last 40 years. And, and I, I, think back to my time at Duke, my freshman year, um, you know, you were one of the first people that told us we were going to a war in, in Iraq. Uh, right. That was, that was right around March madness. My senior year, you were the first person that told us what was happening with, with the Duke lacrosse team and that these charges were going to be brought. Like I remember vividly pulling up to Cameron right after the ACC championship, my senior year, and, and you coming to the back of the bus and telling us what's going on. How difficult was it to, to sort of have that conversation this past season with your guys? Hey, guys, March Madness has been canceled. And for you know some of the older guys or even some freshmen that maybe decided to leave, their, their careers at Duke were abruptly right. cut, cut short. Well, that for everybody, really, in college basketball. And it, it started in the ACC tournament where we were going to play at 2.30 in the afternoon. And that morning... It was the morning after Gobert was tested positive. And I, I saw that late at night. I knew the world would change then, you know, like it was going to be different. And that morning at breakfast, I could tell my team there was a different mood. So I sat down with them. I said, how do you feel? And they, they felt scared. They didn't know. And I said, well, let's, let's talk about this. I'm going to call my AD, my president and get guidance from them. And then, we met a little bit later and uh, they, they were, they did not want to play. They were afraid that something would happen. And that was smart on their part. And my president was just about to make the decision to cut spring sports already. And so he just made that announcement then and Vince price. And then the ball kept going Now, saying that, uh, they didn't know that that meant the NCAA tournament was not going to happen. But that morning I said, you know, just so you know, when we we're not playing, it could be that, you know, the NCAA tournament will not be played, but no one knew anything then. And I asked my president, whatever statement they put out, 
to say, even though we were postponing or canceling or whatever, it wouldn't be for the entire time because maybe two months from now they would allow it. But when it became aware that it's not going to happen, a big thing in, in any type of situations like this is closure. So how will you have closure with these guys? And so, you know, I, I met with them individually and, uh, you know, we, that, that weekend, uh, when they were going to announce the NCAA tournament, but didn't before they went home, we were trying to keep them at Duke, but Duke wanted everybody out. Uh, we actually had a dinner uh, at the U Club, and we created a video of one shining moment. And we and we had all their their thing. I got chills. Just it was such a good night. And I said, "You guys, you guys won. You know, you guys won." And so then we kept in contact. And the weekend of the Final Four, on the Saturday of the Final Four, you know, that's the best day where four teams come together. And I called, I FaceTimed, which I usually don't do. And you, I apologize for people having to look at me for this amount of time, but uh, I don't FaceTime very much because my nose and ears take up most of the screen. But uh, uh, I FaceTimed each one of them. It took most of the day and had a long time. I said, I want you to imagine yourself. Today, you would have been in Atlanta you would have been playing in front of 75,000 people. Just close your eyes sometime today and think of yourself doing that. And then on Monday, the national championship day, I had a, a team meeting at 8.30, 8.45, a Zoom. And that would be the time you would come into the locker room for the last time. And I was actually dressed up in a coat and tie and I told him, I said, I want you to think of a few things. I want you to imagine yourself being there. And I want you to, uh, you know, be in this moment. And then I gave a pregame speech about what they did. And I said, and, you know, you guys, you went from, you won the ACC tournament, then you were a number two seed. And then we, we went through those first two rounds and we killed people. But, man, that Sweet 16 game. You know, we're, we're down by eight with four minutes to go. And I don't know how the hell you guys did it, but you did it and you came through. And, and then, you know, we're, we, we go to the uh, Elite Eight and we win and we're in the Final Four. And on Saturday, you guys were amazing. To win by 25 points in a semifinal game is incredible. And now you're in the moment that you dreamed of, playing for the national championship. And what you dreamed of was unbelievable. But you know what? The one thing about dreams is when they become reality, it's reality tonight. Let's go out and be national champions. And, uh, and, uh, and then two hours later, uh, we uh, sent out a, uh, some stuff to them. And it was one shining moment. We had a banner made national champions 2020. And so, you know, stuff like that is – those kids deserve that. And, uh, uh, and, and it, was, it was – you know what? It was really good for me to do it. You know, I, if I felt good about doing it because, you know, the journey that you have with a, a team, I've had 46 journeys, or I'm going to have my 46th. Uh, with and then besides the U.S. team, and uh, uh, each one is its own entity, and then you have to wrap it up. You know, like you wrap it up, but you, how you wrap it up is important because for the rest of your life, that team will remember how you wrap it up, and uh, you owe that to the unit. I learned that in the military too. You know, you don't have your unit all the time. There's a start and a finish. And then there's a passing of, of a ton to somebody who's going to take over that unit. And uh, I believe in that stuff. And I think that's one of the reasons we have such great relationships with our guys. Uh, 
And it's a thing that keeps all you guys the same. You know, you all have done your individual journeys. It wasn't the same amount of wins and whatever, but there was a good ending, a good start. We went for it. And even if we didn't win the whole thing, it was a good ending. And um, we did it together. So that's what we tried to do with this. You know, I, I can't imagine how <laughs> difficult and creative you had to get to, to put closure on a season like this. Um, I didn't get the closure that I wanted at Duke, which right. would have been a national championship. And the closest I came uh, in my four years was my sophomore year. And we, we made the Final Four. We lost to UConn. There was a couple plays at the end of the game where I had the ball in my hand, one that would have given us the lead and then a, a chance to, to tie on a three. I got stripped on one play and, and missed the three on the other. But that entire sophomore year for me, and I, I've, I've told parts of this, but you know, in December I had my sisters come meet me on campus and I, I really was thinking hard about quitting because the pressure and all of the, the hate that was coming my way, it just it didn't feel like it was worth it. Um, and you and I talked, I guess in February after a Valparaiso game, it was the first time that, um, that you kind of, I think it was maybe the first time that you had noticed that I was, something was amiss. Right. Um, do, do you, do you remember anything from, from that, that winner of my sophomore year and, and kind of, kind of, when did you notice that, uh, I wasn't all there? Well, I don't remember a lot from it. You know, what I overall I remember about your sophomore year was one of the critical years in your life uh, because you learned the price that you had to pay to be that successful and, and what it t- took to be on the stage. You weren't old enough or have experience enough to handle it like you do now or that, you know, as a man and, and, there really wasn't enough people. There weren't people. It's not like your family knew, <laughs> you know, or anybody. It's hard. Like most people don't know. And I didn't know you were going through it. But then, you know, you once we knew about it, you know, we as a program tried to help you with it. And uh, and we're then isn't it amazing. Then after all that, it's something you embraced. You know, it like, became my life. Yeah, it became my you, life. Yeah, but you embraced it, and that's the thing. A lot. It's the same thing. It's similar to what we talked about with the, your pro career. There's a, you know, I call them bridges. You know, they're they're bridges that people have to cross in order to fulfill their potential, uh, their potential, what their talent and motivation can do for them, and. It's one of the great things that I, I've loved about college is I've been able to cross a lot of bridges with guys. You know, you had a bridge in your pro career that was a tough one, but you had a coach in the pros that was tough. And, but he was tough. He was tough because he believed in you, not because he didn't believe in you. And then you came to the place where you crossed bridges. And I don't know if you've ever thought about it that way, but, you know, sometimes coming back home or coming to a place that where you had achieved not just one, not just hit shots, but you crossed a bridge. You crossed something that, that was tough and you surrounded yourself. You don't cross, you usually don't cross a bridge alone. And so you got Will, you got a whole bunch of people, and, and you did it. You know, during your sophomore year, uh, it was so damn new, and uh, it wears on you. Also, you're a kid. I was 19. Yeah, you're a kid. 19. You want to have fun. You want to do that. Yeah. You, wanna, you wanna wanted be to be a frat, a frat kid sometimes. Yeah, you want to <laughs> yeah. So all of that stuff is there. Are you in Schwartz Butters right now? Are you in your office in Schwartz Butters right now? I'm in my, yeah, my conference room. Yeah. Yeah, okay. So May 21st, 2004 was probably the most important day of my basketball career. And that's when Wojo and Collins tracked me down. 
Right. I was staying in an off-campus apartment. I wasn't enrolled in summer school. I was just kind of chilling. I told my parents I was finishing up an incomplete because my grades were so bad. And uh, I think I maybe had told you guys that I was at, <laughs> at my parents in Virginia. And Wojo and Collins tracked me down because Shavlik Randolph is a snitch. And he said he saw me at this one apartment. But I, they dragged me up to your office. And we sat there and we had a very emotional meeting. Um, but you talk about sur- like being surrounded by love and, and to a degree like forgiveness. Like I don't even think looking back, like I didn't think I deserved a second chance at the time. And for you to give me that second chance and to say, no, we're going to help you make it right. We're going to put you on this program. We're going to put you on this schedule. Um, we're going to surround you with all the resources you need. You, you, know, you want somebody to talk to, we'll give you somebody to talk to. Uh, you want help with nutrition, we're going to give you help with the nutrition. I, it was, it was life-changing. That, that, that day was life-changing. Well, and then we tracked you every second of the day. Yes. But you, when something is happening to a person, a lot of times that person feels it only happens to him or her. And it's never happened to any, you. You feel guilty. You feel ashamed. And you're a little, you're a little bit bewildered or a lot bewildered. And the thing is, the people in the room with you, I mean, I've gone through that. I, I know it's hard to believe, but I was 19 at one time. I was, you know, I, I, I was messed up at different times. Wojo and Chris. And, and so it wasn't like we didn't know that that can happen. It didn't happen to the level that it was happening to you because of how good you were. You know, there was a, a bigger spotlight. And part of, your, part of the problem you had was you needed to get away from the spotlight and be a guy, be a kid. And that spotlight was there all the time. Like, how the hell do I get rid of this? And, uh, and we had to spend the time with you to show you how you can lead a life being in that spotlight. And uh, you learned that. That's why I'm saying you embraced it. And and Wojo and Chris did an amazing job. Uh, it, it's one of those things as an assistant coach in the fine print and additional duties as assigned by the head coach. Uh, yeah. I was, I was, coach, I was going to ask that about about sort of spotting these bridges with your guys because, you know, we had, we had Grayson on a couple of weeks ago and we talked about how he went through some similar things, but with JJ or with Grayson where it's, you know, so obvious they're whatever star players, they're in the spotlight. It may be more clear, but you know, when you have guys who maybe aren't playing as much or whatever it is, is that really like the, the role of the assistant to just be sort of seeing this before it kind of comes to a head? Well, I think, for all of us, I, I, I kind of think that's my job. I, I watch my guys a lot, and I watch body language, moods, facial expressions, and uh, a lot of times I can tell if something's wrong. And then my guys see it too, and then we'll talk about, about it. I mean, we, you know, we're going to have a meeting later today, and uh, part of it is we're getting to know these guys you know, like I watch them like crazy, uh, who's a little bit weaker, who's a little bit stronger interactions. And, and then if there's any change in, in character in activity, uh, and to nip it at, at the bud, so to speak. And I believe in counseling, you know, I've, I, in my life, I've done in the mid nineties, I went through a, a really difficult time with injury and, and, uh, a lack, a, a loss of feeling. And uh, I believe there's nothing wrong with that. It's a sign of strength. And so we provide counseling for our players and, and uh, not just our counseling. And I think it's good. And I, I, I think it's good for people to, uh, to take advantage of that for, throughout their lives. And, uh, uh, and that helps. That, that, that real help. And, you know, for a player, I think they know then, you know, I think they know already, but they really know that we care about them, you know, not just to, uh, not just to score. Look, I'm not going to lose my job if we don't win the whole thing or, you know, I, 
you know, like I do this because I want to be in the moment of these kids, not uh, in, in whatever's going to happen with this group. And that's still very exciting to me. But I, I also want to be there, you know, like I have so many guys that played for me. <laughs> and, and it, you know, I talked to three of them yesterday in different, for different reasons. And it's so fulfilling. Yeah. You know, let me, can I tell you a quick story? This is a, a great thing. Uh, Marshall Plumley. Marshall Plumley wanted to be in the army and he went and he, you know, he played well here. He was in the NBA off and on, but he had to follow, he went ROTC and then he, he went full board and now he's a Ranger airborne. He calls me yesterday He's so proud. And he's one of those guys that when you hear his voice on the phone, you feel good. It's full of life. It's, it's like there's not enough seconds in the day for this kid to live. And he said, Coach, I just went through three weeks of amazing training. And uh, I was try I'm trying to qualify for the 3rd Ranger Regiment in Fort Benning. It's one of the elite groups in the world. And he said, I, I, I was picked. And he said the toughest que the question, he said, that was so good during the interview. They said, well, why do you want to be in the 3rd Ranger Regiment, uh, Officer Plumley?" And he said, you know, when I was a sophomore at Duke, Coach K spoke for General Brown down at Fort Benning when they were combining the armor and infantry units in the United States Army. And Bob Brown was in charge of that. And he brought back a hat from the 3rd Ranger Regiment. And I gave it to uh, Marshall, and I said, I think, you know, you love this. And, and uh, I said, the third Ranger unit is like Duke basketball and basketball. And uh, he said, and I've always, I get, I, I, I want to cry, really. This kid is unbelievable. And he says, uh, you, Coach, I told him it was my dream to be in the third Ranger regiment, and, and I am. And I said, you son of a bucket, man. You are a stud. I am so damn proud of you. I said, no one's followed his heart like you have. And those are the things, uh, you know, throughout that a college, like for me, I, I recruit good guys and they become really good men. And then uh, you're able to follow their, their lives and be a part of their life. It's, to me, that's the best thing. That that's happened in my career, but Marshall's story is—it's an amazing—it's an amazing story. It's an amazing, amazing story. Yeah, seven one. I know. He's in it's, a it's, ranger it's, unit. It's he's amazing. He's jumping out of airplanes. He's crawling <laughs> under crap, and he's and he's smiling about it and having fun. Holy crap! And you used to complain about extra sprints, JJ. Oh, <laughs> you, I'm soft. I'm yeah. soft. <laughs> Tommy, Coach is the ultimate body language reader, by the way. <laughs> I know you said that earlier. My senior year, when I broke the ACC scoring record, it was a game in Philly. We were playing Temple at uh, Wells Fargo, or whatever the arena was called back then. And John Chaney had told his players, J.J. Redick is not going to break the ACC scoring record against us. We're going box and one, okay? So I didn't get a lot of clean looks. I ended up with like 13 points or something and broke the record in the set at halftime i put a piece of gum in my mouth okay so when we watched film the following day coach points out he's like why the fuck are you chewing gum why are you chewing gum what is this as if well, the gum, gum as if the gum was the reason i didn't have a great game no, but that means you, and it wasn't the boxing one no it was uh, you were, it, they screwed you up and you went to the gum it's like it's a true. seinfeld episode going to yeah. the gum <laughs> oh man i'm gonna i'm gonna wrap i'm gonna wrap the sophomore to junior year story with two two quick anecdotes so there's a moment we win the acc championship my junior year against georgia tech and i got no emotion. guards with no guards on the floor in the last yeah. six minutes <laughs> yeah i know yeah. everybody had fouled out yeah. um and i got emotional after the game and i and i i basically buried my head in your chest and and there's a picture of it, and you, you actually sent me that picture right, framed right. Uh, about six months ago. Um, but the moment I, I always remember was we lose in the Sweet 16 to Michigan State, 
Um, and we're in Austin. You call me up to your hotel room after the game. We chatted. And that moment, I think, to me, at least in my sort of personal life, was the moment that we became friends. Where that, that surrealness that had been there my first two years and during my recruitment, that was gone because of that year that I had gone through with right, you right, right. and the way that you had embraced me. Like That was the moment where we became friends. And uh, we've been friends for you know, 16 years since. It's great. Mm-hmm. You know, one quick thing about that Georgia Tech game. So, you know, J.J.'s the only guard in the game. Sheldon Williams and Shavlik Randolph are bringing the ball up the court. (laughs) And we have a lead, but we're milking that damn thing as much as possible. And with a little bit over a minute to go, and there's like 26, 25 seconds on the shot clock, right in front of our bench, J.J. pulls up and shoots. And, and he hits and he looks at me and he goes, <laughs> the shrug. <laughs> I said, you son of a buck. And I had to, it's the dagger. You got to put him away. You got to put him away. Tommy, co- coach and I used to watch tape. This is, this was the other thing. Like coach was the first coach that I had that embraced me shooting threes in transition. Like no, everybody does that now. Nobody was doing back, that back then, but Peja was. And so pay, he would, he would, he would, because coach watches NBA every night. He would watch a, a Kings game like late night, get the, get the video from the night before and then show me. And I think, and you talked a little bit about how I, I maybe should have shot more, but my confidence as a shooter and as a player, a lot of that comes from having played for you. And I think that you do that with, a lot of your great players is that you you give them full empowerment. You give them full ownership of of the bus or the ship, whatever you want to call it. And and by going through the fire with you on that, it, g- it gave me all the confidence in the world. So for me to take a terrible shot with a minute to go, I still do that. I still am going to try to put a team away. Well, along with that, you know, I've had a chance to coach more great players than anyone because of being at Duke with so many, but also the 11 years of coach in the U S and like in college, especially great players have to be able to follow their instincts and you can put them in positions, but if you put, don't put them in a box, let them go. And this, the single easiest time for you to get a shot was before the defense got there, whether we were, we had a numerical advantage or not. It didn't matter. You were going to hit about 50% of your shots. And so in transition, take it, man. And, and your teammates should know that. And in that, the chaos of transition, if it was a long rebound, you, you probably have a 50-50 chance of getting the rebound. So it's like a free shot. You know, for my whole career, too, I, we're the ones who uh, – started that on an offensive board, you'd kick it out. And I always told you guys, that's my shot. That's a free shot. You have to take, I don't care who it is. You have to take the shot on an offensive rebound kick out. We'd, we'd and, watch film on that all the time. Yeah. Where like you'd show us missed opportunities and, and you'd show guys who didn't shoot or you'd show the rebounder, get the ball and be like, look, there's, there's the guy that's open. That's the shot right there. Right. Now everybody does it, and, yeah, and, and it's hard. And but you, you know, it, it's fun. It's kind of like, you know, you're you're up in New York, and I'm sure when Broadway was going on, you go, like, oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah. yeah. And it, it's like me being like a producer or a director, and you have that singer or dancer, or, you know, like go for it, man. You know, like, uh, you know, we can play the music and we can surround you with good people, but there's something you will do in that moment that nobody can teach you. And those are, I love those. I love that. You know, I, uh, I, I love it. And you were, you were one of those guys there, you know, there aren't that many that played a Duke like that. You know, there are uh, a few more recently, but they're not here long. So you only, you know, you only get to do that for a year with them and they never really 
get to the level of doing that that they would if they were here long. And I'm not saying they shouldn't go. Don't get me wrong. But uh, for you, I had it's like having Grant for four years or Leitner for four years, uh, intellectually and and defensively and uh, Battier for four years. You know, they there are just some things that Hurley for four years. They they do thing. You guys do things that you can't teach. You you uh, you can't teach and. Uh, I, you know, Tommy Co- coach just named all his favorite players. That's what it was. <laughs> just named. It. I didn't name all my favorite players. I'm just kidding. Um, I told I told John Jackson to tell you, don't don't do that and ask me the all time favorite team. I know, I know. That. Like that's, I told uh, I told John. I said, John, we were gonna make coach draft to start. We do a draft every episode. I'm like, we're gonna make coach draft a Duke starting five. And basically, JJ was like, it, "It's not going to happen. It's, it's not, not going to happen." And you I, would be so disappointed. <laughs> on how that, that the you draft didn't draft me. Turn out. <laughs> That's really, really why I told him not not to do it. I I I, I would. Have you ever cried on your podcast? Yeah, you know, once yes, I actually did cry. Well, that would have been another yeah. time. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't. I, I didn't. I didn't want it to happen on my watch. <laughs> Not on my watch. Tommy, we, I don't remember if it was a birthday or if it was you breaking the, the wins record, but one year at K Academy, we did a roast of Coach K. Oh, and, yeah. And uh, his do- his do- Debbie organized it, and she asked me uh, to be one of the roasters. Um, and part of the shtick was that Coach's favorite player was Shane Battier. <laughs> And that every time you that he heard the word Battier, he got a little movement. He got a little excited. <laughs> do, you, do you sense some jealousy here? Yes. Uh, uh, this is like, this is not this is not the first uh, time yeah, like, Shane's Shane's name has caused this on this show. Yeah, like come on. And and when did I ever say that? But you know, it might be true. It might be. Uh, I love it. I don't. I, I know it's not me. It's fine. You'll. You, you, I'll get it out of Debbie or Lindy at some point. But I know it's not me. It's fine. It's fine. Um, when when did you did you consciously decide to embrace the one and done era? Because Grace and I we talked about this with Grayson. So Grayson played with I think eleven or twelve guys. <laughs> I played with one. I played with Lou Aldang. That was right. a one and done. Grayson in his four years played with if you count. Um, uh Duvall uh he he played with 12 guys um so it, it seems like in the way that you recruited maybe post 2010 2011 where you were getting maybe one one and done guy and now it's you know four or five guys it seems like that are coming in every year no we didn't change our recruiting yeah uh, we look for three things you know you got to be really talented you don't have to be a pro right away but or even a pro at the end, but you have to be really good. And then we have to get a bunch, a few guys that are going to be pros. Then they have to be, you know, pretty good academically because we have one of the great schools in the world. And the third thing, and they're all equal, they have to be good guys. And so we haven't changed. It's just that the world changed. The salaries of the NBA changed, you know, the, and so, and then we have produced a lot of pros and, and we have a we have a we have one of the great programs, and so guys come here and it financially beneficial for them to to leave. And but we haven't changed. That doesn't mean we've embraced one and done. We just look if you if you came in now, okay, uh, just to use like a Tyler Hero as an example, you know, you would be either a lottery pick or uh, mid first round after your rookie year. And would you go, you know, and chances are you would, and you should, if you're going to be drafted that high, you know, like a Luke Kennard was here for two years. He didn't think he's going to, but we, we had everybody hurt during that year and he was the only one who wasn't. And, had a great year and he came in and he and his dad almost apologized. I don't know. I said, no, you got to go. <laughs> You're going to be somewhere around the 15th pick. You're, 
you know, six, five white guy who can shoot and who can shoot really well. And you just had as good a year as you might have in college. You know, you should take advantage of it. So it's more uh, that the financial opportunities and, and, you know, the NBA, it, it, I don't know, it's a crazy league. It's a great league, but there are opportunities out there for young guys. And, uh, uh, but I, I, we haven't changed. JJ, JJ, do you think you would have gone if we, if you, cause the Tyler, the Tyler yeah. comp is interesting. Cause it is, a, he, it is a little similar in terms of, uh, you know, where he was after his freshman year. If, if he was Tom, I would tell him to go. Yeah. You know, because not after his sophomore year. Yeah. <laughs> not after I would have got eaten alive in the NBA. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I, I think the mindset that I had is way different than the mindset that college kids have now or that high school kids yeah. have now. Because when I, when I was in school, you know, you could still get drafted out of high school. And a lot of guys did. My draft class in 06 was the first draft where you couldn't go out of high school. And so growing up and being a Duke fan, my mindset was always four years. I want to break the scoring record. I want to get my jersey retired. Like Those were more important to me at the time than getting to the NBA. Right. The second part of this is I think – you almost get punished now by staying in school. Sometimes, yeah. You know, they're looking. They're looking at that age. That's that's as 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 important as any of your physical measurements or any of your stats. That age is an important stat, and so I think it it can hurt you sometimes if you end up being a twenty two year old senior like I was. Yeah. Um, as opposed to Tyler Hero, who's nineteen. Yeah. Let me tell. Like uh, one of our key players from last year, Cassius Stanley who's going to be a good pro and a great kid. He had an, started every game for us, was really good. But he, he was already 21. He was an older freshman. And, and he and his family loved Duke and great student. And, but they couldn't stay because of age. You, you know, like if you get too old, then you – what you just said is absolutely true. It, uh, people look at that. So – uh, we understand that. That's yeah. You know, that's part of you know. You have to keep adapting to the environment you're in. You know, that's one of the key things about s sustained excellence is the ability to adapt to new environments. And and uh, you know, for me, you know, I'm 73 years old. I, I, I'm coaching kids that are 18 to 22. You know, I'm 50 years older than these kids. And, and, uh, so I got to adapt how I talk to them, how, what I wear, I'm wearing air force ones and, and, uh, my, my sweats can't be too baggy. And, and, uh, I got to stay in, and I would like to stay in decent shape anyway, but, uh, and then I got to know what the hell they're doing. I got to, you know, follow them on Instagram and, and, uh, learn a little bit about, and I like that. And so you adapt to how you communicate. What you do not adapt to is what you communicate. How you communicate, you adapt. What you communicate are the same. They're the same values of integrity and courage and respect and selfless service and loyalty and trust, all, the, all those things, and duty. And uh, they're just taught a little bit differently than the way we taught you. And, but it's the same less, it, it's the same values based system. And obviously, fundamentally, basketball wise, I always personalize for that team, but it, it, it's, it changes. It, you, know, it, you have to embrace change. It, you can't be talking about how it used to be. How it used to be, it, what, what it, way it was. How it used to be is not the way it is. And, and forget about how it will be. That'll take care of itself if you take care of what it is right now. And so you have to embrace the moment that you're in with the people that you're in with. And it's up to the leader to make those, uh, uh, to adapt in that. I call, you know, I call it being an agile learner and, and, uh, and, uh, and a curious person where you are constantly trying to learn. You know, you, you know, if you st stop learning, you might as well 
yeah, you might, you, you definitely should get out of coaching, but, uh, you know, that, that's what living is about. It's about learning and interacting and being in moments. And, you know, at 73, for me to be in these moments with these kids, that's crazy good. It's unbelievably good. I always, I've always said this. When people ask about you, because I get asked about you all the time, you know, I, coach is a great coach, blah, 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 but his greatest strength is adaptability. And you said it. You know, you, you've adapted – um, how you've coached, not what you've coached. You've adapted how you've coached. And then year to year, you adapt to the personnel that you have on your right. team. It's not, Duke doesn't have a system. The system right. is the people that you have on your team that year. And then you maximize the gifts and the talents of those players year to year. You're, you know, if, if you had Marvin Bagley and Wendell Carter on the team, you're not running jj reddick floppy action every time down the floor you know uh so you you adapt year to year you brought up something a second ago about embracing change and let's zoom out for a second on a macro level in, in this country right now right there's some people that don't want to embrace change and you've been outspoken on a number of issues recently uh, and you and I did something together for TNT the other night. Um, I, I would assume you've got to be pretty excited a, as an older person in this country to watch the younger generation be so active and ask for a lot of things that are, are just basic moral human rights right. issues. Well, I am. And the, one of the reasons is that uh, the younger generation uh, sees things through a lens that I did not see when I was their age. Uh, and because of the environment that we all grew up in in the 60s and 70s. And uh, this, ge this generation does not see uh, color, gender, nationality, religion. They, they see a person, you know, they are, uh, they are, they will totally embrace you as a, as a person. And there's so many in this generation that feel that way. Not everybody, obviously, that this is the time, th this is the time to uh, unite the, the talents of the great people that we have in this country who are you know, different gender, different color, different nationality. Uh, you know, it, it's it's time to do that and understand that that's a strength. And uh, for me, I didn't realize how behind we were because of the Zoom calls that we've had with the Brotherhood really opened my eyes. Not opened my eyes, it gave my eyes more depth uh, where I I felt instead of, you know, I, I always say, you don't own anything by just hearing and seeing it. You have to feel it. And, and I felt it over these, you know, and, and uh, I'm really proud of what my guys are doing and what we're doing. This is a time in our country where we have a chance to, to be one. And, you know, I, I believe right now we're, you know, I hear people say we're better than this, and and uh, and that's both part everybody. And we are not. We are not better than this right now. You know, we have to get better than this, and we have been better. We should watch old tapes, you know, of when we were better than this. But at this point, we are not, and we should. You know, in order to make to change something, you have to acknowledge that there is a problem you and 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 there is a problem and it's everybody's fault it's not it's not one person's fault it's everybody's fault and it'll be everybody's fault if we put it together so in 2004 i'm visiting my aunt in iowa it's like july 4th week and i get a phone call from you and you're like hey man uh, i'm thinking about taking the lakers job and then you went radio silent for about three or four days. 
and I'm sitting there that weekend, and I'm like calling my buddies at University of Texas, or I had two buddies that played at University of Iowa, and I happened to be in the state, and I was like, yo, if coach takes the Lakers job, I'm out. I'm leaving. And remind you, this was coming off my sophomore year, where I'm already like, I'm already, you know, dealing with some stuff. How close, how close were you to taking the Lakers job? Yeah, closer than any other offer I ever had. And really in depth, I've only entertained two NBA offers, uh, one in 90 when Dave Gavitt was in control of the uh, uh, – I love Dave Gavitt. He's one of the, the great men ever. And uh, he took over the Celtics. And I always – I grew up with the Lakers and the Celtics, you know, the two brands. And I didn't take it. And then we, we won two national championships the next two years. So uh, – but with the Lakers, you know, I was 57 – and I said, you know, is there something more? Is, is, is there, I love what, I, what I'm doing. I love Duke. I love, but is there something more? And I'm not going to be doing this forever. Maybe, and I, I knew Kobe. Uh, and they were at my house. They offered a lot of money. And we were building the Emily Krzyzewski Center at that time. And they offered to do the rest of the building of that. And, 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 uh, and so when they left the house, it was, you know, like, this is like generational wealth. You know, this is not, you, you got to consider it. And, uh, but this is a, this is a true story. It's a funny story. Uh, I think it's funny. And so one of the guys who, one of the people, you know, we all need a few people to believe in us in our life. The guy who hired me here, who has passed away, uh, Tom Butters, believed in me three times. And, and it was critical in all three times. And so he was no longer my AD, but I called him. I said, I said, Tom. And it was 25 years after he hired me. And uh, I said, Tom, when you hired me, uh, you, uh, you paid me $40,000. And to be quite frank, I, I accepted the job here without even knowing how much money I was going to make. But anyway, that's another story. And uh, I said, and so the financial thing, the first thing financially from them at that time, which it's a lot of money ever, but at that time, they offered me $40 million. Okay. And so I said, Tom, 40,000, 40 million. And I said, what do you think? He said, I think you should send me a 10% finder's fee. <laughs> I said, you son of a bucket. And I hung up on it. And uh, but, uh, I just couldn't do it. And I, I, I love Duke and I love this. And ironically, a few months after that, Jerry Colangelo asked me to coach the U.S. team. And I, I did that for a lot. I loved that. And, and we've won gold medals, you know, three Olympics, two world championships, a couple more national championships. And, and, uh, but that it, it was it was interesting during that time. But I'm I'm really really pleased that I did not do that. <laughs> Coach, do you do you have any favorite uh, Kobe stories? Yeah, you know, uh, a number of them. The best one, or one of the best ones, was you know when we uh, were starting to build a culture uh, at uh, USA Basketball. And, he, Chauncey Billups, and Jason Kidd were added to add uh, veteran leadership to LeBron and Carmelo and you know those those guys who were great guys. And so we're getting ready to <laughs> uh, uh, to, to get ready for Beijing. And uh, so I'm with my staff in Vegas a couple of days before the team comes in, and uh, all of a sudden there's a 
knock on the door just two days early and it's Kobe. He said, coach, can, can I talk to you for a minute? And I said, certainly. So we went to a private room and I, I said, what do you need? And he said, I, I, I need to ask you a favor. And I, and I said, yeah, what, what is it? And he said, I want to guard the best perimeter player on every team that we play. Now he's the NBA scoring champ. He's the best player in the league at that time. He had seven 50 point games that year. And he, he knew that he would have to change a little bit and be a leader. And, and, but he says, I, I, you know, I want to guard the best perimeter player. And then he pauses and, you know, his eyes, he and Jordan have the same, had the same eyes. They killed you with their eyes. And, and he leans forward and he said, Coach, I promise you I'll destroy him. <laughs> so I, I got, holy shit. I said, this is good. So uh, we go and we have a team meeting. And the first practice, he doesn't take a shot. He does not take one shot. And he, he's playing defense. And so I call him over afterwards. I said, you know, yo, this destroy thing. He says, coach, I, I promised you I'll destroy him. I said, look, I've seen you destroy teams offensively. Will you shoot the freaking ball? <laughs> and he smiled, you know, he had that smile. And he said from then on, I was the only coach ever to ask him to shoot. <laughs> and you know what he was doing, JJ? He, he had this vision of moments. He knew that for us to win the gold medal, we would have to beat Argentina whether it be in a semis or the gold medal game, and that he wanted to guard Ginobili. Believe me, he already had that f figured out, and he was going to prepare to guard Ginobili. It wasn't just to set an example for his team. He had that vision. Crazy. So we do play Argentina in the semis, and we're beating them by 20 points, and Ginobili gets hurt. So now you think we're going to win by 40. And it becomes a six-point game because now he's not interested anymore. That's who he is. That's who he was. God bless him. And uh, I love the guy. And he and LeBron developed a relationship that was needed to create the culture. And they did. I, I'm so proud of LeBron for doing that. And obviously, I was very proud of Kobe for doing it. You were uh, you were also a coach on the '92 Dream Team, right? Um, in a hypothetical world, the Redeem Team and the Dream Team play a seven game series. Who wins that series? Well, in their when they were all healthy, yeah, healthy and prime. Yeah, no, the Dream Team, but they weren't all healthy in '92. Yeah, that Bird was banged up. Magic Bird? was later. Yeah. Yeah, and Stockton was not read, you know. Uh, but in their prime, I mean, you're talking about 11 Hall of Famers and uh, the greatest team. You know what? And that was the first time uh, that uh, the NBA came to the Olympics. And that was a visionary moment by David Stern and the NBA. And it was uh, an atomic bomb for the world of, for the global world of basketball. Those guys were rock stars there. And, you know, they were such gentlemen. They represented us so damn well. And the NBA of the 80s built the NBA of who you are today. And those guys brought, we didn't have a culture for USA basketball. They brought their culture to USA basketball for that moment. Then it didn't stay after that. And it was, it was a moment in time, really uh, uh, a moment in time. They, I mean, you're talking about when you're, you know, whatever t starting five you pick all time, there are a few of them in that, <laughs> on that team. You know, I don't care who you're, who you are. Maybe some of the younger people today they don't know how good Magic or Bird, or these guys, even Jordan, they they 
you know, but, uh, and one thing too about Kobe, Kobe was this generation's Jordan. And the, when he was that horrific accident, and I can remember bringing my whole team upstairs to my sixth floor office and they were crying. I was telling them stories because I didn't realize how much of a hero he was to this generation, to this generation. And, uh, and in some respects, LeBron has been that now. And uh, I'm proud of him because he carries a mantle. He, he carries a lot of burden. And, uh, and especially at this time of, of uh, social unrest, uh, he has really, really put it out there as, as the league. You know, the NBA should be very proud about how they've handled this whole thing. You got you got the best commissioner in sport. You know, Adam is, and his team has done an, that bubble. It was amazing. It worked, and and everyone was safe. You know what? What an amazing job! You don't know when you're going to play, though, do you? Again? <laughs> no. Yeah. No. It's going to be late January, early February. Yeah. That's what I think. Yeah. Um, when you, because you've gotten to sort of peek behind the curtain. Uh, of the NBA, right? By your involvement with USA Basketball, when you go back and talk to your Duke guys, what are what are the observations that you're sharing with them about LeBron or about Kobe? Like, what is what are, what are the things that you notice that are that are separators for those guys? Well, I use them as examples of, you know, the very first thing is preparation. You know, just how how the elite pro player prepares and, and uh, yeah, I tell them stories of, you know, when we're with the U S team, you know, I had to, I remember the first meeting I had, I had it with Dwayne Wade, Jason, Kobe and LeBron. And I said, well, you know, I think we should have two practices a day, one physical and then one walk through. And, and they said, whoa, 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 whoa. No, we, coach, we can't do that. And so I don't know if they're punking me or whatever they're doing. I, I, I said, look, you you should understand we all have our individual workout routines, and we will need time every day to do our individual stuff. Give us periods of time in the morning, after practice, and at night. And guys will fill those windows and then – we can, you know, it's good to meet in the, late in the morning and then have practice, and we'll we'll take care of that. And I had to; they were they weren't punking me. They 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 have their individual routines, whether it be, you know, yoga, Pilates, you know, what extra shooting. And I then had all these people, Wojo, Chris Collins, all these guys working for me throughout the day. They were going to gyms, doing this and whatever. And uh, I've learned that, wow, these guys prepare. And then the respect that they showed, you know, how they look at you, you know, if you know, the face-to-face -face contact and, and how they studied the game. You know, if we went through a scouting report and said, these are the six things Argentina does in a conference room, by the time we got to the gym, LeBron knew all of them. Chris Paul knew all of them. So I had to adjust and, you know, like, we're, well, here's the top ball screen. Before I said anything, I would ask, what do you think? And, it, and Chris would say this or LeBron would say this. And most of the time, it was what I was going to say. Sometimes it was a lot better. But, you know, they owned it. And we had to do, you know, I found myself doing, I can't do that with my own team as much, but I will ask him, what do you think? You know, and, uh, and then how, how well they took care of their bodies, how they ate, you know, LeBron has the same guy working with him since he's 20. Before he played, he, I think he stretched for 45 minutes. <sighs> you know, you know, some of our guys want to show up. You mean I have to show up 45 minutes? <laughs> yeah. And the, I, I guess the, the key word here is commitment. 
to, to a high level of excellence. And uh, they only see the finished product. They don't know what goes on behind. And I thought I knew a lot about what, behind, what went on behind, but I didn't. And, you know, the relationships or the, the shared, I call it shared best practices of being on that Olympic, Olympic t- team. And those guys could be their own guys. You know, if they're with their own teams, they can't show weakness or, or whatever. They got to play the role. But with that team, they were, they could hang out a little bit. And uh, when, I don't know if I told you this story, but when we added Kobe, uh, Jason kid and uh, Chauncey, who I love, I love Chauncey. And I went, I flew up to Akron to talk to LeBron and I said, look, we're, you know, we need, we need this. What do you think? He says, no, whatever. He says, you know, uh, Jay Kidd is the best passer in the NBA. He said, I'm a good passer. I think I can learn from him. And Kobe prepares better than everybody. I think I could learn from him. And every meeting, LeBron sat right next to Jason. And every night, they went out to shoot together. You know, and I, I see this. Then in 212, we had this young guy called Anthony Davis who didn't play as much in the London Olympics. And I see the mentoring that LeBron did with him there or the, all the guys. And so now you see him in the, in, in the moment of maybe winning an, uh, an NBA championship. And so that, that melting pot of talent that USA basketball was able to create and these guys giving it up really has made the game better. Uh, it's made the game game better because you pass on some of these secrets. You know, like what book are you going to look at? <laughs> no, there is no book. You know, but if you watch, if and if Anthony watches how LeBron prepares and talks, and yeah, I think it's passing on these elite preparation secrets on on. The achievement of excellence that uh, and I I saw it happening and uh, uh, it, it, <laughs> you know a, a great place to be in. Part of the reason that I get so jazzed about this stage of my career and the the mentoring part, the leadership part, is is sharing some of those secrets. And it's not just with it's, not, it's legitimately not just with my teammates. I mean, I have young guys in the league texting me or asking me stuff after games or if I see them at, at dinner or whatever. And it's, I, I think it's part of, as a, when you get older, you, you realize like it's part of your, your legacy as a player is to, is to share. And, and somebody shared it with me. Somebody helped me. Uh, it's, it's my turn to, to, to pay, that, pay that forward. Let me tell you one thing with New Orleans. They're fortunate to have you and I know all the people down there, and as good a player as you are, you doing that helps develop culture. You know, there, there, are, there are a number of teams that have traditions, you know, but there aren't as many teams that have cultures. And it's culture that wins, not tradition culture wins and sometimes you don't develop culture because you take tradition you think tradition is enough and uh so having veterans who have gone through it and understand and are willing to share like you could be in a position where you don't want to share because you don't want a younger guy to take your place and uh, tell me that that doesn't happen and uh and so if you can get a collection of people who will do that, old, new, and talented, then you got a chance. you got a chance to develop a culture that, uh, that will be deserving of winning. You, you don't just win. You have to be deserving of winning before you win. And uh, I, I, I'm excited what, how it will go for you down, down there. Coach, um... We appreciate the time greatly. 
This has been uh, a lot of fun. It's always good to catch up with you. I'm looking forward to being able to see you in person and have some wine with you. Um, yeah, you're a wine guy. Yeah. <laughs> well, I want to say, with no. all the wine, I haven't gotten any. I, I'm more of a California uh, uh, cab guy, Sauvignon Blanc, uh, Oregon. Uh, I like know. Oregon. I like Oregon. Oregon's great. Yeah. You're all the, you got all the French and Spanish. And, yeah, you're you've come a long way from the from the mountains in Roanoke. I'll tell you that. Where they didn't even have cork. They didn't See, even have cork. Coach is trying to pr- portray me as the wine snob. So my wedding back in 2010, I didn't know a whole lot about wine, and I was on a budget, and I wanted to I wanted to keep that budget. So we had picked out. A couple wines to serve at the dinner, and they, uh, in retrospect, they weren't great wines. And coach, Pay the least. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> coach, coach flies in, and he's you know we, we at the at the dinner or whatever. I noticed that he's called the sommelier over, <laughs> and he's got the wine book, and he's ordering a bunch of different great great wine for his table, and he did not did not share any of that with mine. It's okay. It's well, okay. You- no, because now you sip. At that time, you gulped. <laughs> you were not a sipper at that time. You were a gulper. Uh, that's facts. That's facts. All right, Coach. We appreciate it. Thank you, man. All Thank right. You, Coach. I, I loved it.